So today we'll speak about our uh, rocket family called Arguna and uh, show you some uh, results and movies and images of uh, the last uh, star starting campaigns of these rockets. And I hope it will, you will enjoy because there are a lot of images and graphs and movies, not so much formulas as for the last talks. So why do we do this? What's our motivation? Well, we want to test on suborbital flights. That is, we have uh, some subsystems. We want to know if they work on a real rocket. So we use a smaller rocket uh, to go up to the stratosphere or, or higher and then look uh, in microgravity environment and vib vibration and high acceleration if the system are ready to go for space. And then uh, we are very interested in experiments in micro G as during the free fall time of this rocket, a few seconds to 20, 30, 40 seconds, there is nearly absolutely no gravity. So microgravity is called. And in this environment, we can do special experiments like chemical experiments, physical experiments of uh, all kinds, and uh, material science experiments. So and of course, our goal with this, with this uh, family of rockets is uh, to cross the Kármán line. In other words, to reach space, suborbitally, but to reach it. So 80 kilometers plus. So the philosophy is keep it simple, stupid. We had some problems in the past with complex systems, and we thought, OK, one of our guys developed uh, a solid rocket motor, and he had flown a lot of uh, smaller rockets, and they're working just fine. So why don't you just use it and, and get flying? So we used this solid rocket engine based on candy or on an epoxy composite propellant, uh, which he's an expert on, Ziggy. We'll see him later in the movie. And uh, he, he's building rocket motors since, I don't know, 50 years or so. Uh, so he began very, uh, as a very small child making black powder rockets. And then he, he developed a special candy, a so-called so super candy, aluminum candy. And an epoxy composite is very powerful between 130 and 180 seconds. So we use common materials for our rockets. For example, the Arguna 2 here is mainly made out of, uh, of wood, aluminum, and PVC plastic, so nothing exotic, no titanium, no beryllium, no whatever. So maybe the, the nozzle is made of graphite, but that's the most exotic material we use. And of course, it has to be simple to manufacture them. So the first Arguna rocket that we have not in the display here wasn't uh, built without even using a lath, okay? Just a hammer, a saw, a drill, and of course, uh, a lot of sandpaper. And it leads, of course, to low budget. For example, this rocket, the Arguna 2, will be in the range of one kilo euro in material, of course, a lot of time. And here, the Arguna 4, the larger rocket, will be about uh, 2K in, in material and raw, raw things that you need. But of course, you put in a lot of effort, and uh, you use hundreds of hours of, of manpower that are totally for free, because we are just doing it for fun. And very important to us, the rockets should be reusable. So we have a recovery system. So they don't go ballistic and, 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 and join the ground. Uh, it's about getting them back with a payload, if possible. So I'll show you just shortly what we did before we switched to solid rockets. We were mainly engaged in, I have no sound. Yes. Yeah. Louder, please. This is a hybrid rocket engine. And it's a very complex machine. And sometimes things go wrong. So we worked on this hybrid engines for about uh, seven years. And this was in 2001. And in 2004, we had a hybrid rocket engine that was working, and we were very proud of it and so on. But then we understood that it was very difficult to make this hybrid engine fly, because there were so many other subsystems that would be very heavy. And we saw that we would have at least uh, needed three, four years to even get flying. So when our guy Sigi came along, he said, OK, why not? And so we sat down and planned. I'll just show you a promotion video we made. Shows a workshop, how we sat down, thought about it, 
and land this Arguna 4 rocket. So the Arguna 2 rocket was already done. Here you see this is in the Eiffel. It's a radio telescope, the Stockard, that we will use in uh, radio astronomy uh, and in radio amateur experiments. Oh, and during this, this workshop, we designed the next rocket uh, that is still not, not built, and this Arguna 4 rocket. So we thought about avionics, we thought about aerodynamics, about uh, internal ballistics of the motor, and so on. So we sat down for about three, four days, and then we went away in all directions and started to plan and build the thing. The problem that we have as a community is uh, that we are living in totally different parts of Germany. So myself, I come from the northern part of Germany. Here are you, he comes from Eiffel. The western part of Germany, we have some guys in Berlin, we have some guys in the south at the Bodensee. Um, we have some guys in Düsseldorf in the Ruhrgebiet. So it's very difficult to get together, okay? So all our work is done over the internet, just like most hackers do. And then when we come together, we come together to discuss the things we have done. And the parts itself, we have a, a certain workshop in the Eiffel II. Uh, they are designed at different places, produced there, and then integrated normally uh, in the workshop. So this is, this are, this is from uh, last year uh, in Manching. This is in southern part of Bavaria, where we can fly on a small field near an airport. Uh, to about two kilometers. So during the campaign, we just assemble everything on site. It's very simple, just making, just you, as you see. This is, this is Tiggy, by the way. Uh, he lost a finger uh, with, with some of the experiments. So you can see the finger, yeah? Okay. So this is the Arguna 1. And you have to, to be, uh, this is very modular, so you have to build everything uh, on site because you cannot transport it uh, easily when it is built, yeah? because uh, the pins are very fragile, you could, uh, uh, well, make something, nick it, or so, so. We assemble everything on site. Of course, the electronics is also assembled on site and tested just before launch. And uh, for this um, event, we introduced some new features to the rockets, uh, mainly HD cameras because we were very unsatisfied with the movies we got from the former campaign. So now they're making a hole for the camera. And this is the avionic section, so a lot of wires and connectors, it's a mess. We have improved a lot of that, so this Arguna 4 is much more modular than, than the former one. The telemetry module, for example. Yeah, the transmitter. And uh, this is the, our payload with electronics. You can see that we are still working on site. So it's, it's really not uh, like coming together and just launch a rocket. It's really work, and it's a lot of fun. So, and after everything is done, and the rocket is mounted, then we have to bring it to the launch pad. Well, this can take a while. This, by the way, is the largest rocket. We will discuss them in detail. This is the Arguna 3. that had a special sensor, a so-called optical horizon. You see here the opening for the optical horizon, and here the opening for the camera. And this optical horizon can give in-flight data about the attitude of the rocket during flight in relation to the horizon. The rockets are not very heavy. They are about 25 kilograms, so two men can just lift them without problem. Yes? Even with, with fuel on, because we have only about uh, three to four kilograms of fuel in each rocket, because we cannot go very high. As I said, we have a series for two kilometers, no more. So we have, to, we have to build very small motors. So this, this one here is the motor, and it's inside the house. So the motor is not as big as the rocket itself. This is different with the Arguna 4, because this was designed to reach very high altitude. What you can see here are the pyrotechnic charges that will be used to eject the parachute. And this little small mirror here is for the camera, so it can look down while flying. So we, we have a camera mounted in this, in this uh, position, and it will look outwards and downwards. So these are the preparations for launch. And there's an extensive checklist that we have to follow. And this is such a launch. This is the Arguna 3, and it just goes on. Okay, I will show you that you will see the movies later on. And it's so beautiful. Okay, so 
back to lecture. So about the rocket. Our first Arguna rocket, it was uh, based on, on a previous rocket called Vision 3. It was very similar to this rocket and, and um, had uh, two video cameras on board for stereo vision. But this rocket here was specially designed uh, to have payload capacity. So this one can carry about 1.5 kilograms of payload in its bay. And uh, it has a length of 3 meters, diameter of uh, uh, the rocket is 16 centimeters, so it's not very, very large. Lift of mass, as I said, 25 kilograms to payload. The motor has a total impulse of about 4 kilonewton seconds. Uh, and uh, it, uh, it's produced a thrust of about 300 kilopons. So it just it doesn't reach very very high velocity, about 150 meters per second. This is 0.4 mach. Uh, but the acceleration is, is, is large, so it, it takes off with about 12 g, and it reaches a peak height of one kilometer in about 14 seconds. And of course, the parachute is then open, so it descends slowly, and after about two minutes, it lands. And this is an image of the first maiden flight in 2005. So since then, it has flown about six times, I think. And this is the Arguna 2. You can see here on display. So it has a, it's slightly larger than the previous model. And the main difference is that it has been made uh, with a, a much smaller diameter. It has only 11 centimeters in diameter. This is like a, yeah, it's very, very small, like a needle. And um, this has been, the intention was to reduce the air drag. So in this rocket, we can uh, put in three different motors, a very small one for munching, a larger one, uh, which will reach 2.5 kilometers and has been uh, thoroughly used, as can be seen here in the specification, 2.5 kilometers. And we have a very large one uh, that takes up half of the rocket, but uh, we have never used it in practice, but we, would, uh, we, we, we estimate that we could reach five kilometers with this motor, or 4.5 kilometers. So, just another image. So this is the Arguna 2 just after takeoff. The problem with this rocket is because it has a so low air resistance and a stronger motor, it accelerates at about 20 to 25 G. So it's difficult to follow it. And we will see that in the, in the coming movies that uh, people have, have problems following it. So this is the Arguna 3. You just see uh, taking off. It's slightly shorter than the Arguna 2 but uh, has a much larger diameter. Uh, this was made to accommodate more space for payload. So this one can uh, grab about five kilograms of payload, and it gets nearly a, a little bit higher than the Arguna 1. Yeah, but the point is here that we can accommodate larger payloads, like, for example, the optical horizon. OK, and that has you just seen. So this is our new rocket you see here on display, the Arguna 4. Is about a little bit more longer than five meters. It has a very similar diameter to the Arguna 2, a little bit larger, and it has a higher lift of mass of about 50 kilograms. We can put a little bit more payload on it, five kilograms. So if you look at this rocket here, of course I cannot lift it. Uh, we have several, we have two payload sections. So this is the nose, here's payload inside, and this is the, the upper payload section. And we have here the recovery section, this goes until this coupler. And this is the, the, the lower payload section. So here is, this, this is a, a dummy antenna that we are using for testing. Uh, here is a radio beacon inside and the inertial navigation we'll, we'll uh, talk about in a few seconds and uh, some other experiments. And in the upper section we have uh, telemetry uh, that relays uh, GPS information and uh, the information of the scientific payload. Yeah, so I'm hoping. You take it there. So just to show you. So at, at the moment, the motor is empty. So it's about uh, 18 kilograms less weight. Yeah, and you can lift it with two men. No problem. Yeah, no, it's OK. It's OK. OK. So this rocket will hopefully fl fly in uh, one month in Denmark at the nor northern um, northern uh, Shore, uh, to be more specific, in Tranum. And if uh, the weather is not, uh, not appropriate, this happens sometimes in Denmark, then we have another launch window in October in Poland, in Zakopomorskie. And from our estimation, from our calculations, we'll reach 
something between eight kilometers, depending on the elevation, to 10 kilometers. And it will be very fast. So it will reach uh, nearly Mach 2, 1 point something, 1.7 or so. So this will be the first Arguna rocket that will breach uh, uh, Mach 1. Oh, by the way, uh, the starting tower you can see here is eight meters long. Uh, you, you surely wonder why you use such a, a start tower for such a small rocket. Um, the thing is that we are building another rocket, the Arguna 5, that will be slightly less large than this, but uh, very much heavier. So we need a longer tower uh, so the uh, rocket can reach a velocity to be stable after clearing the tower. Okay, now I will show you some videos from our last campaign of these three rockets that have already flown. Um, let's start with, yes, let's start with this one. This was in, in Bergen. This is in, in a training ground in the northern part of Germany. And this is, this is a military place, so everything is, is just burned and, and destroyed and full of ammunition. And we had a permit to launch there with the uh, University of, of Bremen. And this is the Arguna 1, and it will go in this flight to about 900 meters. Sound, please. See, the flight is always very short, especially if there are any clouds in the way. So it's good to have telemetry, otherwise you don't know what is happening to the rocket. And on the same day, on the same day, we had the launch of our Arguna 2 rocket. And uh, we really, really didn't know, know how fast it would go. We just had calculated it because it was the first flight with uh, the, the stronger motor. This is the so-called uh, Suka candy, yeah? Aluminium, you, you, you can see that the flame is not white as is normal by candy because candy, normal candy, is very, um, is not so hot. <laughs> and Suka is much hotter, uh, giving the flame a very uh, orange-red glow. So it just, So that's all you see of the rocket. Uh, you count to three or two, and it's gone. And indeed, it was gone this day. So we didn't find it uh, because it was very windy. And as we later found out, uh, the upper section of the rocket uh, did open both parachutes. We have two parachutes, one small drogue parachute that uh, allows uh, the rocket to fall very fast, and one larger main parachute uh, that uh, is, uh, well, a problem if it opens up in, in such a head because then uh, due to winds, the rocket will move fastly away. And we didn't find it that day and uh, after we, we, we thought we had lost it. Yeah, we, 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 we had a radio beacon on it, but uh, on landing the radio beacon just silenced so we couldn't find it again. And then we had a call four weeks later from the Bundeswehr that someone had been uh, wandering around, his dog had found a rocket. Okay, so we got our rocket back but it was pure luck. Okay, so let's see then. Last year in, in Denmark, we launched again the Arguna 2. Same configuration with Sukamoto, and we told the people it will be very fast. And the military was watching us with a Doppler radar. And before us, there were some uh, school kids. They were launching their small rockets uh, all day long. And these rockets don't go out of sight. They are not very fast uh, compared to Arguna. So everybody was expecting something like that. Later on, the, the military came and asked, what was that? It was too fast for us. We couldn't crack it. <laughs> so then uh, one month later, we flew the three rockets in, in Manching, in the southern, uh, uh, in, in Bavaria. 
And I'll just show you the preparations for the start and the launch itself together with the new HD camera images that we attained during the flight. So these are the pyros. The pyros are a backup, a redundancy, because we want to have our, our, our rockets back, and it's a common knowledge that uh, parachutes tend to not to open if you have only one backup system, uh, uh, only one recovery system, because electronics can fail, especially due to acceleration and vibration. So we use a pyro to be absolutely sure that the, the, the parachute will open. So this is the plate, and you can see that the plate is already quite demolished due to all the rocket motors working on it. And, uh, yeah, okay, just, just watch the moment. So in parallel you can see the images of the HD camera. And here's the airport. And it was a wonderful uh, day with a blue sky, so it was very easy to follow the rocket because it only gets to about one kilometer state, as I said. If you watch closely, okay, it's difficult. Uh, now the parachute has opened, and when the rocket is hanging on the parachutes, it starts to moving very rapidly because it has no active uh, attitude control. So the images, of course, are very moving too. And the, the darker, flank, well, this is, these are the woods. And on the other side, uh, there, there is a lake or some, some lakes. So you really have to launch and, and land on this uh, piece of grass, otherwise the rocket gets lost. Okay. So here you can see the, the launch site, still with smoke. This, this little thing that you saw was a test of a pyrotechnic device we will use on the Arguna 4. Okay, and... That's how a good flight normally looks like. And we had three nice flights this day. Just show you the takeoff. Uh, in slow motion, taken with the Casio AXF1. Because it's so fast, one normally doesn't see any details of the launch. Yeah, so as you can see, I think this is 300 frames per second or, or even more, 600. Um, First, the pyro goes off. This is uh, the, the redundant uh, pyro for the parachute. And then when we visually see, okay, pyro has, has uh, ignited, then the motor is ignited, right, just afterwards, manually. And when it does so, this rocket uh, accelerates at about uh, 11, 12 G. And when it leaves uh, the ramp, it has about 120 kilometers per hour increasing. So after 0 0.67 seconds, it has maximum thrust. Okay, we'll see that later. The other, the other second rocket, the Arguna 2. This was, of course, not with a Suka motor because then it would have been lost. Uh, we only can go to, to two kilometers, so this is the, um, the less large motor with the normal candy. And here, the last preparation are done. This is the, the upper pyro, the lower pyro, and, okay. Yeah, it's very long rocket. So here below, thing is just uh, preparing the igniter. So it's considerably slower as a Suka, not as difficult to follow. And it's very nice. So these are the lakes, beautiful lakes. And this is the part you don't want to land in. This is microgravity now, it's falling. And the sensors react, or the pyro, who's first. 
and then hopefully the parachute opens, like for example, now. And once the parachute opens, it gets very ugly from a point of view, so I, I will just go a little bit forward because this is not a nice view. So we were very close to the lake this time. You can see sometimes still the smoke trail uh, from, from the starting point. Uh, it's very, very bad uh, contrast here, but, but you can see the lake out there, and if we had landed in the lake, the rocket head would have been lost. So we landed instead in a cornfield, what was very simple to retrieve. Okay, after some walking, of course. Okay, and we knew where it had landed because we had always visible contact. So, and again, the flight with the Arguna 3 on this day, uh, for, for first the slow-mo version of this flight taken with the Casio Epic camera. Again, first the pyro up will ignite. Uh, you see the, the pyro burning, and then you ignite the main motor. And this rocket has about, I don't know, 180 kilometers per second when it leaves the ramp. Oh, okay, and it's gone. So, and the third rocket on this day was the Arguna 3. There's the optical horizon. And this one was Suka because it's such a heavy rocket that you have to use Suka even to get to 8 or 1.3 kilometers. No, 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 not due to the, to the weight, uh, due to the larger air resistance because it's very, very uh, large rocket uh, in diameter. Okay, so. Skip that part to go to the landing. Okay. Landing was very smooth. And we could just pick it up and use it again. That's what we call a smooth landing, okay? You don't, you, you don't, haven't seen what, what the Danish people do to the rocket. So, to get back to our talk. We have, of course, payload on board. Um, I, I talked yesterday about the Vionic section. This is uh, the old version of the inertial navigation, called it INA, and it has mainly um, three accelerometers, uh, this is these black guys here, and we have three uh, gyros on board. These are these uh, evaluation boards here, one, two, three, and one pressure sensor. And so you can measure with this module uh, the inertial, the inertial um, observables, acceleration, angular velocity, and additionally the pressure that gives us uh, the height of the rocket above ground. So this is the payload of the Arguna 3, as you have just seen uh, it flee, fly. Um, we, had, we had two. Uh, data processing units on it um, with a propeller chip on it and uh, one GPS module and the INA and the so-called optical horizon. And this here is uh, an improved version of the avionics you just saw. This is the, the Red Queen and it's uh, inside this rocket now. And we have these two sections, the lower section here that uh, contains one uh, data processing unit that uh, gets the inertial observables from the improved INA module and stores, stores this, this uh, information on an SD card and then streams the data upwards to the upper section here, to the recovery section. So there's a cable, an RS232 interface leading up to this section here. And there is a second DPU. And this second DPU stores every information again on uh, an SD card, you know, just to be redundant. And uh, it also measures uh, three observables, uh, the relative velocity with a Prandtl probe, the temperature with uh, uh, RCD, and the pressure, the ambient pressure with uh, some pressure sensor. And uh, connected to the CPU is the GPS unit, so it will uh, relay over the telemetry uh, the GPS coordinates once uh, the parachute is deployed. 
So this is the view of the Red Queen GPU, as you kind of see them here. It's a very simple device. It's just a, a board 60 times 60 millimeters with one chip on it, and the rest is a lot of connectors and, and, and discrete stuff. So let's talk about results. Uh, this is from a flight of the Arguna 1. What you see here is a graph of the three acceler acceleration components in three dimension, x, y, z. So z is the red component. And at landing, we have a very large acceleration, larger than during uh, takeoff. So if you uh, let something fall, you can actually get very high accelerations. So this is uh, um, a zoom in of uh, the first 25 seconds of the flight. So at zero seconds, this is the ignition of the engine and liftoff. And you see that at the same time, you have, have a spike in the x direction and a little spike in, in y direction. This is due to the acceleration the rocket uh, feels uh, on the launch pad when going up the rail, OK? So then it leaves the rail at this moment. And uh, the acceleration of the rocket motor goes up to 11, nearly 12 g, with a max uh, acceleration at about 0 0.7 seconds. And it burns for uh, 1.5 seconds longer. So after 2.3 seconds or so, the motor just shuts off. And no acceleration from the motor is, is, is measured. So instead, what we see is that, that the, the acceleration goes into the negative. Maybe the motor is a little bit chuffing. Maybe it's noise. I don't know. Vibration or so. And what we see here, the envelope, is the air resistance. Yeah, so negative uh, acceleration due to air resistance. And then we enter of 10 seconds into the flight into an area where we measure no acceleration, only noise. So we are in free fall for about, in this case, four seconds. Then at 14.7 uh, seconds, we have a little jerk here. This is the ejection of the drogue chute. And the drogue chute expands one second later. And four or five seconds later, the main chute opens. And the rest of the flight is just uh, hanging on the chute. So this, these are the angular rate sensors. And we see that here in front, they are very, very, very calm, no movement. Then something occurs. It's the launch, the flight, uh, zero gravity. And then the parachute opens. And it hangs on the parachute, and then it lands here. So to look at it in more detail, uh, the red line is the angular velocity around the symmetry axis, so the rotation in this direction, direction of flight. And you see that right after launch, the angular velocity increases steadily until a point where it only decreases. And the other two components, they have a little jerk at the beginning when, they, when, when the rocket leaves the launch pad, but then they are very, very smooth. So the rocket flies stable. It doesn't move around, so it flies, flies straight. But then after a while, it starts to tumble. And then when the, when the parachute opens, it really moves around. So this is overlaid, the acceleration in that axis ex uh, exerted by the motor, so the motor thrust. And you can clearly see that at the moment the motor shuts off, the rotation around the symmetry axis starts to fade. So the motor itself produces the torque to rotate the rocket during takeoff. And that's, of course, due to asymmetries during burn and asymmetry, um, asymmetrical mounting of the motor. OK, so much for that. As an outlook, I want to present you the Arguna 5. It's based on the Aero B design from the 50s. And it will be a slightly larger rocket than the Arguna 4 but uh, much bigger in the sense that it has a larger diameter of about, I think, 27 centimeters. And uh, the lower section here, the lower section is the whole motor. So the motor will contain about 200 kilograms of propellant, uh, not of suka, because suka is too brittle uh, to be built in such large grains. So it will be an epoxy composite that is much more stable. And we have two compartments, one for the recovery and the other one for the payload payload and the nose cone will uh, have also payload. So hopefully, next time we'll see us, uh, I will report on this rocket. So that's all for now. Thank you. <laughs> you finished early. You surprised me. Um, 
any, are there any questions? Um, either from the floor or from the net. I believe we have a stand here even. Wow, God. Okay, uh, I was just wondering for the propellant, uh, you, uh, you call it candy. Is it actually sugar? And yes. What is the oxidizer then? Yeah, okay. Uh, it's, it's actually uh, sugar, that's why I call it candy. But, but there are a lot of sugars. Uh, sugar is every poly alcohol. And uh, there are people who use fructose or glucose, and we use sorbitol, which is a C5 sugar and uh, has a melting point uh, of about 130, 140 degrees Celsius. And what you essentially do while producing the grains is you just take a, a pot, uh, put the sugar in it, melt it over time, of course, using a thermometer, because if you heat sugar too much, it will caramelize. It's always a problem. And then we use uh, sodium nitrate, sodium nitrate as an oxidizer, but you could, could you, of course, use uh, calcium nitrate or whatever oxidizer you want to choose. But nitrates, uh, in our case, nitrates are, are uh, very, very stable, yeah, very stable. Um, um, and we, we add some aluminum, if it's suka, to boost the specific impulse. Okay. Any more questions? Uh, there's one. We've got there's one. Uh, hi. Is there any um, active control? Are you moving the fins or thrust vectoring or anything, or is it just... Going straight up. Yeah, at the moment it's only passive, passively stabilized. Uh, we, we are thinking about it, especially the roll, um, um, because uh, for, for the HD camera, it can take good pictures, but only if the, ca the rocket is really staying as, as straight and not, not rotating. And as you have seen from the gyro um, sensor data output, uh, due to the asymmetries in the, in the thrust profile, um, you get always rotation about the set axis. So this, it would be nice to start with a simple um, stabilizing algorithm that wouldn't impact the real flight of the rocket at the moment. So we have no active uh, um, regulation at the moment, no control. It just okay. flies passively. Okay. Okay. There's one question from the IRC. Um, Crocodilarian wants to know, when do you expect to reach um, low Earth orbit? <laughs> and do you expect to be able to launch a satellite into that orbit? Well. Well, uh, we have no time schedule at the moment, but we are thinking about it. So uh, the Aguna 4 is a project to show that we can reach the stratosphere and get payload back. And uh, the Aguna 5, the project I just uh, mentioned, is, is, a, is a, um, a milestone uh, to reach uh, the space. But from there, it is much more complicated to get into orbit. So we are thinking about it, but we need to uh, use the stage rocket, and we have to um, use another technology for propulsion because uh, this um, solid rocket engines they have specific impulses below 200 seconds and that's not 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 uh, enough to reach orbit. But we're thinking about it. Uh, ask me in five years. Okay. We have plenty of time, so if you please want to ask questions, we have a good 15 minutes left. You have an expert here. Go grab them. Take a chance. Cooperation between you, your group, and the Copenhagen suborbitals, by the way? Um, so. No, sadly not. Uh, we tried. We had some contact, uh, but they were so involved in their, in their launching campaign this summer uh, that they don't, didn't want to be disturbed. So they just don't uh, talk with you, OK? But of course, we are interested in cooperation all the time because there are so many synergies that could be uh, used uh, in cooperation. There's a cooperation with Dennis Space Challenge in Denmark, and uh, we launched together with them, and we tried to exchange technologies. Uh, but it's, it's uh, really, really difficult to join all the European amateur groups because we are just, everyone is working alone and, and doing his stuff and, and not paying attention to what is happening in, in other countries and, and other groups. I do actually have a second question. I guess I could just look at the model here, but uh, I was thinking, how do you actually eject the, the parachute? I guess you then split the rocket like the, the small ones because that would probably do a huge bang when it opens. Yeah, that's a good question. Okay, so we have, this is the drogue chute from a drone, the CL289, if someone wants to check. It's a, it's a drone 
that lands uh, by just ejecting this drogue chute uh, from about 700 kilometers per hour or so. It's very fast. It's a very heavy drone, so 200 kilogram or so. And what we do is we stuff this drogue chute in the upper part of the recovery section. So this section here is the drogue chute. And then up here, there is a CO2 capsule that is opened at the moment of, of recovery initiation. And then this front part here is movable. It is only held um, by, by two pins, by shearable pins made of uh, nylon. And then it shears away uh, by the gas pressure. The gas flows into the section onto the drogue chute. And then this here leaves off with a few meters per second pulling out the drogue chute. And it opens, and the rocket hangs at, on the drogue chute for about uh, five minutes, four minutes, depending on, 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 the, on the temperature and so on. Yeah, sure. Just open it. If it doesn't, uh, if it, yeah, OK. So if you put uh, 50 bars of CO2, it's much faster. Yes? Yeah. So and then there is the main chute. The main chute is, is, the, is the largest part, so something like that. And when we reach about 300 meters, a second pile of fires uh, releases the main chute. The main chute opens. And then it, it, it pulls out a buoy. Okay, because in Denmark we have to land on water, so we have to we have to use something uh, that uh, helps the rocket to float because it would just go under. It is too heavy uh, to float by itself. Okay. They only leave through the front. Sorry. The the lines all leave through the front then. The lines. So it hangs on the tip of the rocket. Uh, the top top line. The the chute is attached at the front of the. Lo uh, the, the, the chute is attached at this point here, yeah. and there are shock bands uh, leaving up to here. And then, of course, the shock band has here extra protection, so it cannot be ripped apart if there's right. some bending. Okay? So yeah. So, so at, at, the, at, the, at the drogue chute, the, the GPS antenna is positioned. So with the drogue chute, the GPS antenna is pulled out, and then uh, the, the rocket can get GPS information and uh, telemetry relay to the ground station. That's the plan, anyway. <laughs> we'll see. OK. By the way, uh, please uh, vote in the intranet on the talks. If you do so, don't complain about missing technical details, because now you have the chance to ask. <laughs> so please ask if anything comes to mind. There, there are no dumb questions. Ah, another question, very well. Progress of your rockets. At one point, you reached the speed of sound, as I understand. Yes, this one will will reach and 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 go through the sound barrier. So there's no for me there's no significant difference in the design of the rocket. There, I mean, for the for the airplanes, there's a significant difference in aerodynamics yes, when yes, you get yes. the speed of sound. It's for rockets. There, that's no special thing, or. Oh yes, there is. There is. Um, don't think that these these two are very much related. They are very different in design. So this here is a, is, is a full metal jacket, if you want so. This is made totally out of metal. It's very sturdy. It's very heavy compared to this one. It's made mainly out of a, a very very uh, small um, aluminum and and and, and uh, wood, wooden parts and so on. So as as you when you reach the sound barrier at Mach one. Uh, then the problems begin because uh, the, um, the pressure point um, it's wandering all the time and there may be problems to it and the drag of course increases dramatically and uh, it can happen that the fins disintegrate so you have to look uh, especially at the fin design but of course uh, this rocket is very long we have um, well we don't know if there will be any vibrations we hope we have made it uh, strong enough to survive it because when you cross the sound barrier there will be vibrations, no, no matter what. That's, that's true, yeah. So this, this rocket is much, much more sturdier than the three uh, former rockets. OK? So. About five more minutes if you want to ask anything else.
I guess it's my job to um, close this out. Can I thank you, sir? Yeah. Um, David Manila. F-A-R. For a truly amazing, wonderful talk. That was truly fascinating. Um, and that's kind of it for the session. Um, one last thing, a um, couple things. Um, if you do have any more questions, can you do it outside? Because we've got to set up for the next session. Um, do we have something online? Okay, just one more quick. One more question. Um, have you thought about launching from a balloon to get to 50 kilometers and then to launch the rocket from there? Is that possible? Oh, yes. The balloon thing. And there are, out there are a lot of balloonies that think that launching from a balloon solves the problem to reach higher altitudes. Guess what? It's worse. It's worse. If, if you want to launch from a balloon, you have to build a balloon. Okay? That's normal. Then you have to fill it with something, like helium, for example, which is very expensive. So a filling of helium for a balloon to launch a very high, a large rocket may be even more costly than the whole rocket itself. So instead of launching from a balloon, what we do is just build larger rockets, put more propellant inside. It's much, much uh, cheaper because one kilogram of propellant may cost you five to ten euros. And uh, look, at, look up the price of helium, for example. Of course, you could ch choose another gas uh, for the balloon or even use a hot air balloon. But uh, if, if you make the calculations, it isn't worth it. It's just too much... Uh, um, technical problems that, that uh, arrive uh, if you want to make something from a balloon. You have no control. You cannot go up with a balloon and fix something or check it or so. Everything has to go smooth. And every time someone tries to launch a rocket from a balloon, there are problems that would arise that are absolutely unnecessary because when you launch from, from ground, there are no such problems. So we don't want to launch from balloons. OK, is there anybody else? Any bells on the net? Good. Ah, another question. I, I just uh, thought of a thing because I don't remember if you did talk about this in your hybrid rocket talk. Uh, do you have some sort of, did, did you do any tests with a hybrid engine? Do you have any sort of preliminary design of some parts or even the of, whole of, engine? Of, of a hybrid engine? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah we, we, we had a working design at the end, but the specific compass ver was very low because the burning efficiency was too low. Um, then we made some tests with paraffine and a diaphragm. So we positioned the diaphragm at different points in the burning chamber, and indeed the diaphragm increased the burning efficiency to a, to a higher level. Uh, but since then, we have not made any, any progress on that. But we are planning, uh, after finishing the Aguna 5 project, which will be a very large solid rocket motor, then we will get to a point where increasing the solid propellant grains and increasing uh, the, um, the fuel amount uh, will, will really make th things very difficult. Because if you're, 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 you have about, let's say this, this are about uh, le less than 20 kilograms of propellant. So you can transport it, and, and it's not very dangerous if you carry it around. But if you're producing it, it is dangerous. So you're producing uh, something in a hot melt, because candy has to be produced in hot melt. So it's dangerous. So you don't want to produce very large quantities, just like one kilo or two at, at, in one batch. And uh, when you produce composites, then you make it with uh, polymers. But uh, as we have seen, the specific impulse is not very encouraging. So around 130, 140, 150 or so, pushing in with aluminum, you can get to 160 or 70, but no more. So you have to change the oxidizer. You have to go to ammonium nitrate, for example, to get over 200. But then again, uh, ammonium nitrate is much more volatile than uh, sodium nitrate or something like that, then it gets dangerous. Then you have, uh, at the moment, you have a grain with 100 kilograms of propellant that is explosive, okay? And then you think about, oh, maybe I want to change the technology to something that cannot explode like hybrids. And that's what we are going to do. We're going to build now this rocket and show that we can go to space, and then we go back to the hybrids and build something large. And there are designs, especially by AMROC, and uh, there are a lot of designs, and they are all open, so you can just read them and use them. And that's what we do. OK. Another question from the IRC. Well, from the IRC. Um, what kind of official allowments are needed to launch such a rocket? Motor, free airspace, whatever. Yes, yes, this is very difficult. Um, I'm not a specialist in this, this uh, juristic domain. Uh, but I follow very closely the problems that our, uh, use, uh, well, our guys that are specialized in this had. 
Uh, well, in Germany, essentially nothing is possible except uh, flying small model rockets. So this, this one is declared as a model rocket, okay? And, uh, okay, with, with the Arguna 4, it's getting quite complicated to define it as a model rocket. Uh, so what we did is uh, we, we tried for about five years to get a permit to launch in a military space in Germany, and it was denied from us from, uh, from the local authorities uh, by several bogus reasons, as usual, in Germany. But we, had, we have friends in Denmark and Poland and so on, and they just invited us, come over here, we can launch this. So uh, in, in, Den in, in Denmark, there is an agreement between uh, a group and the, and, and, the, and the local authorities of the shooting ground, and in Poland there's a similar agreement. So you can just go there if you have a rocket and launch to 10 kilometers. That's possible, okay? But if you want to go much higher than 10 kilometers, it's getting complicated. You have to go to the north of Europe, especially to Norway and Sweden, uh, Kiruna and so on, and you can really buy for a day a launching ground where you can go up to 1,000 kilometers or so and test your rockets. But then you have to really be sure that it's worthwhile that you have a rocket that is uh, working, a working design. Then you can go up to Northern Europe. Okay? Is everybody done? Well, I'll do that again. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for a really amazing talk.